This is One on One. The legendary Ray Chu as producer, composer, music director, um, six years old, you uh, entered Juilliard. We, it was, uh, they, my mother uh, was, a, was a visionary, brought me over to, uh, Juilliard was up near uh, Columbia University at the time, and we lived in the projects, the Grant projects down the block. You lived in New York? That's right, I grew up in Harlem and the Bronx. And my mother brought me over there because I would play the piano. My father was a musician. And, uh, and I would, she would, he would sit me on his lap and I would play and then they would play notes and I could always recite the notes. And they said, wow, this kid's got something special. <laughs> so anyway, take me over to you know, the, the music school and you know, they'd have me tested. And, uh, and they started, you know, they found out I had perfect pitch and this and that and I could play anything you know, uh, by ear at the moment. And they said, well, we gotta get this guy into training. So they gave me a scholarship. When I started my music study uh, at the age six, yeah. How about this? How about some credits? Uh, Showtime at the Apollo. You're the music director there for 10 years. Actually, it was probably more like 15. No, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had, uh, I probably got, I think I started with Showtime around uh, 94 and rode it all the way out, so yeah. What was it like for you growing up in the shadow of the Apollo and then going there and playing that role? Well, it was, it was one thing that always sparked my interest being in the neighborhood and, see, you know, and, and growing up, you know, it was the legendary theater that we would go see all of you know, these great acts. I, my grandfather uh, had a music store right around the corner from the Apollo and our, and our family roots were always, you know, rooted right in Harlem, right, especially right around that area. So in the summertime, I would, I would be out there, you know, shining shoes and, and selling stuff, he had, he had me on a watermelon stand. Okay, huh, huh <laughs> okay. Uh, a watermelon stand, I, I, but I could see the line around the Apollo. I would know what artist possibly, you know, what, uh, what level artist. James Brown, the line would be wrapped wow. around twice. People would stand out there all day, the temptations. So we could see, and if it wasn't wrapped around twice, it was probably somebody not quite as big. Mm. But then, you know, we'd find a way to sneak in, you know, because I couldn't afford to, to pay a ticket. So I'd find my way in, to, you know, to, to see some of the acts. It was just great to be in that theater. And the theater, and then to finally get a chance to work in there where I could feel the, the legacy and the legend. I could feel the spirits of all those who have, you know, who have, they, it's, you know, to who have played that place, it seems to have almost been like some kind of uh, spirit glue. It's <laughs> amazing. Yeah, you because know, when you go in it, it, you feel like they're still there, you know. Uh, and, and it was great spending a lot of, you know, years in there and also adding my name to the plaque of, in the legacy of the Apollo. Let's talk about some of the credit, other credits. Uh, Saturday Night Live. Ah, what'd you that, do there? You're the music yeah, director. Actually, well, no, I wasn't the music director. You were not. I was the I was the arranger, one of the arrangers, and I was one of the uh, I composed music, and I was also the the pianist for the Saturday Night Live band during the Eddie Murphy years. And, what was uh, that like? It was great. It was great. As a matter of fact, that was that was actually my first TV 
show job where I, you know, where I, you know, we reported to work every every week and a couple of times a week, and we were recording, doing all that stuff. And to do a show like that where you have to be quick and nimble, it's live TV. You don't get a chance to to do it again. It's not tape. It's That's it's right. happening live. So you learned a lot about. I learned a lot about, you know, how to really perform under immediate circumstances. You were telling me as before we got on the air, you deal with one of the other shows, Dancing with the Stars. Dancing with the Stars. Any That's pressure there? Oh yeah. <laughs> no, no. Now, other than technical pressures. Yeah. Talk about the pressures of dealing with the some of the stars or those who think they're stars. Well, I would say that I, I treat uh, I treat them all exactly the same. Mm. Uh, everybody that that I'm, that comes into my circle or that I go into their circle, mm. uh, my job is to supply the music with great, consistent music that uh, supply the show with great music that they know what to expect. And towards that, you know, there are always some challenges. You know, scheduling this. You know, musical changes, different desires over what you know, what the, uh, what the what ego involved. Yeah. How much? Eh, there's always, you know, because the, you know, you have everybody's got their artistic endeavor on the line. You know, right. everything's at, at stake, and at the high stakes, it's a highly rated, you know, prime time network TV show. So everybody wants to always come off as being their absolute best. Towards that, I'm, 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 uh, I was ready for that. I know what to expect. And so, you know, with, with, uh, when, when I'm met with the challenge, I meet it head on, I go right for it. What about American Idol? American Idol, same way. Same, same way. really? Well, you know, it, well, I would say different in, in the respect that that was, I'd say, one of the big first, you know, competition shows. And, that, and, that, and with that, that was, you know, the, the banner setter. That was the one that set the you know set the level for all the other shows to come, uh, and so with that I had to carry the torch you know of saying hey listen you know what you know how, how do we keep this show really vibrant and musically in in great shape you know and I focused on that but also in other areas where I had to also involve myself because the three years that I was there also produced all of the music props so I wound up during the course of one season I would produce about. 120 different musical products that we would do separately in the outside studio, and so and he wanted to produce them like you know like regular uh, CD recordings, and so it was all I had a uh, a schedule that was seven days a week. Uh, Where's your downtime? There was no downtime. It was you know you basically rested just to, so that you could get up and do it again. <laughs> well, talk about it now because we, again we were uh, before we got on the air we were talking. A little bit about how you manage your life, manage your career, and you know, a lot of people who come in here and sit in this chair say, "As long as I'm working, I'm good," and I, and I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. If I'm working, I'm good because if you're not working, it means something's wrong, right? Because you're doing what you love, and if you're not, that means either you don't have the sponsors, or nobody wants you to do it, or the demand's not there. For you, you keep this constant schedule, but you also said you don't need to be the one out front. You don't need to be the star. And you're dealing with a lot of shows for whom a lot of people need to be out front. Yeah. How do you manage being so successful without being the one that's always out front? That's not, I mean, you're not out front. How does that work? Well, with any kind of enterprise, there's, there's a support system. And I'm, you know, I'm part of the support system. And there's a lot of, lot of work to be done. And, and there's a lot of stars in the support system. Uh, there's a lot of we call them rock stars, you know. So anytime you see a great show on TV, you can bet you can bet there's some really rock stars uh, in the in the production. Even if the general public doesn't know who he or she is. Correct. As a matter of fact, the general public de definitely usually doesn't. Uh, but the industry I, people know. Yeah, all the industry people they definitely know. All all of the producers they know who the you know the rock stars of the industry are. And, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, they wind up doing a lot of the, a lot of shows that you see, and that, and and they wind up being uh, uh, called by some of the same producers, you know. And so I, I get calls to do a lot of different shows. Yeah. Right here at NJ Pack. A couple of years ago, we had the gala, right? Yeah, the yeah. Gala that you, you were the music director for. And, and I was a co-producer of it. Yeah. yeah. We had Darlene Love. Yeah. And you had some incredible other talented people here as well, right? Yeah, yeah there were some people from Motown and, yeah, some great stuff. Yeah. You had to bring them all together. Uh, Carnegie Hall? Yeah, Carnegie Hall. What do you got Hall? coming up? I have, uh, we have a, a series of events that will uh, continue uh, uh, through, 
16 and 17. And this actually started a, a few years back when they, they brought me in as a producer to do a series of events with Jesse Norman, uh, the opera star. Great and opera star. Yeah, absolutely. She's great. Yeah, and then they, after that, they, they said, hey, Ray, we like the way you, you handled that whole you know, business of, of producing with Jesse, and we want you to come in and bring some of your own stuff. And I, was like, I was really happy to do that. And I know they wanted to diversify their programming. They wanted to do some things other than the classical repertoire. Mm. And so I had, a, I had a wonderful idea, my wife and I, that was born in, right, right in our house, and it was called the Night of Inspiration. And I said, why, why don't we do a, a wonderful night of, you know, this, this speaks diverse, diversity when we can, musical diversity, when we could uh, bring secular and gospel music or inspirational music together on the great stage of Carnegie Hall with an orchestra mm. and a 120 you know, mass uh, choir and an artist. We had Michael McDonald, BBC C. Winans, Patty Griffin, Sheila E. Uh, it was just a vision, this whole thing. It was, it was great. We, it, it, was, it, was, it was well balanced just in terms of genre and, and presentation. All the performances were great. It was, it was by their standard one of the greatest nights of Carnegie Hall history. That's beautiful. Uh, you're going to finish up the show by performing. Yeah, you know what? I, as, I, as I continue to do work as a musical director, I, I have to remind myself that I was a pianist first. Right. And I love playing the instrument. And in and, and, and the times that I do have, I'll turn the light out and go in the room and just start playing the piano, you know. And, and sometimes it happens at four in the morning, sometimes it's four in the afternoon. And so I just love the piano, you know. What are you gonna play for us? I don't know, I'm gonna get over there. Are and, you serious? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and <laughs> feel something out, you know. See where my hands take me, you know. Over and I here? do that sometimes. I, I'll, I'll not give it a lot of uh, forethought. I tell you what, we are gonna sit back and enjoy Ray Chu, producer, composer, music director, and uh, Someone who loves to just sit at the piano and see what comes out. That's right. That's Ray, right. Uh, you honor us by being here at NJ Pack. Thank you. Thank you, My buddy. Pleasure We're going to sit back there. and listen, okay? Great. Let me go, go now. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll go right now. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in cooperation with NJTV.
and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ NJPAC has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, Cohn Resnick, the Fidelco Group, NJ Best, and by Josh S. Weston. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.